this spring. Only one hero can save her family and prevent disaster. Mom, we're gonna be late for school. I don't think so. Whoa. Experience the phenomenon that critics are calling inspiring. Mom, I can't find number 17. Come on, Billy. Dig deep. A lot of fun. And pure genius. Mom, where's my phone? Table. Keys. Mudroom. Dragon Man. Under the couch between the monkey and the flip-flop. How does she do that? Created by God to demonstrate his love with grace, elegance, and poise. Butane torch. All right, so uh, happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Uh, can we give a round of applause to all the moms? Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Debbie is going to join me for a message for Mother's Day today. This, uh, Debbie's my wife and uh, the mom of our three sons. And so happy Mother's Day to you. Thank you very much. What do you think of the video? I think I could have been in that video. I love that video. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty inspiring. And so today I invited Debbie to come because we want to encourage moms with a story from the Old Testament, a story of a mom in the Bible. Her name was Hannah. She was the mother of an Old Testament prophet named Samuel. And what made her special was not only was she good at all the things that moms have to be good at, but she was a godly woman during a time she was seeking God when other people were pretty much doing whatever was right in their own eyes. In fact, um, the whole story that we're going to read today took place in the days of the judges when people did what was, what was right in their own eyes. And Debbie, when we talked about this, you found Hannah's story fascinating. Hannah is an incredible hero to me. She is a woman of inspiration, and we have a lot of neat things to share about her. Not just about her, but I mean, we could all learn from her, not just for moms, everybody. Right, and so it's a good thing to celebrate godly moms on Mother's Day, and we're going to do that today. And so listen to Proverbs 31. Her children stand and bless her. Her husband praises her. There are many virtuous and capable women in the world, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive. Beauty doesn't last, but a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. So I'm going to pray for this message today, but in order to do that, I'd like for all the moms to stay seated and like for everybody else to stand, if we could. All the moms stay seated. Everybody else stand. And we're going to pray that God is going to uh, speak today and show us how we can encourage our moms so we can bless them. Will you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we just want to stand exactly like uh, Solomon said in Proverbs 31. We're going to stand up and pray that you will bless the moms, that you'll bless the moms we know, that you'll encourage them today, that you will strengthen them. They are valuable, and they've added so much to our lives. We're grateful for them. And so, God, today, I pray that you will show us some things from Hannah's life that will encourage moms and encourage us, all of us, and show us how we can pass those things on to the people we know. Thanks for this day. Thanks for moms. Bless our time together. Move Debbie and I out of the way. Show us what you want us to learn. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, the first thing we want you to know is that uh, the story of Hannah is a story of a real woman. In fact, point two on your outline, and for those of you who are watching us online, you can go to centeringlives.com and grab the outline there. But the idea is simply this, that um, she was a woman who knew all about heartache and mistreatment. I mean, Debbie, sometimes when we read stories in the Bible, we think the people in the Bible just had these charmed lives where there were no problems, right? Yeah, that's what we might think, but we'd be totally wrong. And so we're going to jump into Hannah's story um, because she does have a lot of wonderful things that happen in her life. But she also has a lot of great heartache that um, I think we can all relate to. So let me just read the scripture, 1 Samuel 1. Um, Elkanah had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Peninnah. All right, let me just stop you for a second. Don't get tripped up too much by the polygamy going on here. That was what was happening. Remember, this was a day, these were the days, remember, it was doing what was right in their own eyes. 
In those days, agricultural economy, you passed on your inheritance to the male children. And so if a man married a wife and she didn't give him sons, then a practical solution, even though it wasn't what God wanted in Genesis, how we're supposed to run our families, practical solution was, well, just get another one. You get another wife, she can have kids, and then you have two wives. And they'll get along famously, right? I'm sure, yeah, I'm, no. I'm sure that was not the case, as yeah, we're about this to was see. A, this, the, you'll see. This didn't turn out. This yeah. solved one problem, created others. Oh, it's a bad idea. Anyway, yeah. um, so Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh. And whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Peninnah and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her, wife, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. And this went on year after year. And whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband, Elkanah, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than 10 sons? And by the way, before we get any further, guys, the next time your wife is upset to tell her, hey, just eat some more. And aren't you lucky to be married to me? Probably won't help, okay? That's probably not the most helpful thing you could say because I think every woman reading that going, no, you're not helping, Elkanah. That is yeah. not helping. He was a mess, and I doubt we'll be talking about him on Father's Day. That's all I'm going to say about him. Uh, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Okay, we'll move on. <laughs> but, anyway, hey. I, I, I want to point out a couple of things about Hannah. I love Hannah, and you're going to fall in love with her as we read this. And he did love her, so that, that was good. But um, Hannah did know all about heartache. If you can imagine um, these two women, one has children, one does not. And Hannah was, um, wanted to be a mother. She was suffering from infertility. And, you know, that's a, a difficult, difficult um, situation to be in, and we don't want to make light of that. It's a very sensitive um, topic, and I, I know even when um, we had a daughter that didn't live very long, I remember after she died just being totally consumed with fear that I would never be a mother because that was the desire of my heart, and, um, you know, I guess, and then once you have children, I had boys, and then the heartache still came with being a mom for lots of different reasons. I mean, your children sometimes make choices or, or um, go um, in different paths that you wish they hadn't taken, and it can break your heart. And so part of being a mother is, is having heartache, and um, Hannah was certainly there. But the good news, look at the life application the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. Yeah, and what you're going to see here in this story with Hannah is that the Lord was close to her. And in the margin, if you could write, even when it doesn't feel like it. Oh, this is why this is an application for you and me. We need to really believe this. Hannah is about to experience God moving in her life when things seemed like they couldn't get any worse. I mean, when you go to a feast like what they were going to, you would offer sacrifices. You'd offer an animal for sacrifice. You could take part of the meat back and share it with your family. And so you had all this great cuts of meat, and everybody was supposed to be feasting, especially if it was a feast of the tabernacles. That was a feast of God's bounty and his provision, and he provided crops and children. And here's Hannah, and Peninnah is there going, yeah, isn't it great how God has provided me with all these children? Oh, I'm sorry, Hannah, you don't have any. And it would just crush her. And so the time when she was supposed to be in the presence of the Lord rejoicing, it was so painful she couldn't even eat. And I want to remind us here, I mean, sometimes when we pray for, we prayed for a lot of women to have children and things. There are some women who can't even be here today on a Mother's Day. They can't, they say, I can't come to church on Mother's Day. It's just too sensitive for me right now. You may know someone like that today. And I pray that you'll, that you'll use this scripture to remind them that the Lord is close to them. And also here's another one from Hebrews 4 that reminds us that Jesus understands our weaknesses. Jesus understands our weaknesses. Could we just say that much together, please? Jesus understands our weaknesses. 
One more time. Jesus understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he didn't sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we'll find grace to help us when we need it most. You're going, well, Jesus didn't deal with infertility as a mom. No, he didn't. But if you're thinking about where Hannah was, she felt like she was in God's presence, but God was far away, that God had forsaken her. Remember Jesus hanging on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus understands. Jesus understands what it's like to be provoked by people who are trying to cause you harm. Not only would he understand where Hannah was with relation to Peninnah, I mean, Jesus hung on that cross. People were spitting on him and mocking him as he was dying on the cross to pay for their sins. He knew about sacrifice. He knew about misunderstanding. He knew what it felt like to be far away from God, and everybody in the world had turned their back on him, literally. And so there's every reason in the world to come to him. And let me just read that last sentence again, or the last phrase, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Oh, Hannah is about to experience this, God's grace and his help when she needed it the most. And the reason we're going through this story is She's going to do that. She's going to turn to God. In fact, that's the next point in your outline, that Hannah took her problems to the Lord. And so let me just read a little bit of this for you. Once uh, they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, when they had finished, Hannah stood up. And now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. And in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. So what you've got to imagine is there's this big feast. People are feasting everywhere. Think a big tailgate party is what it would look like. There would have been all sorts of feasting going on, and everybody's happy. It's a big celebration, except for Hannah. And her heart is so crushed. Peninnah has just dug into her one more time. She can't take it. She gets up from the table, runs away, goes to the tabernacle. It's a portable temple. It's a tent, and she's praying there. In deep anguish, she prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly, and she made a vow saying, O Lord Almighty, if you only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I'll give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. Uh, In the Old Testament book of Numbers, in chapter 6, there's a whole chapter there where you could take a special vow if you wanted to dedicate your life specifically to the service of the Lord for a year or five or whatever it was, instructions on how to do that. And she's saying, I'm going to dedicate this child from day one before he's even born for his whole life. If you'll just remember me, Lord. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli, the old priest, observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. So Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I'm a woman who's deeply troubled. I haven't been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Don't take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. And so Eli answered, Well, then go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you've asked of him. And she said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. And then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. I don't know if you can relate to Hannah at this point, but she is so broken that her um, pain is so deep that she's just crying out to the Lord over and over and over. She kept on praying to the Lord. And there have been times in my life as a mother where that has um, happened to me over and through the years, many, many times where I've had um, so much uh, turmoil or fear or pain or whatever it was. I was praying for my children and I didn't know what what to pray. That there were times I would just sit and cry. It's like, Lord, you have to work in this situation. You have to help me. And I love this. Look at your note. This is the greatest verse. It says, the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. When you are at that place... Um, sometimes you don't even know what you need. And the Holy Spirit prays on your behalf because he understands not only what you're feeling, he knows your desires, and he knows what you need. And he prays according to the will of our Father. That gives me great, great comfort 
that I can just sit and say, Lord, I don't even know what to do about this. But I'm crying out to you, and I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to pray on my behalf. And, you know, raising three boys, I was there many, many, many times. Oh, yeah. I mean, it all something was always um, happening. I mean, I remember once when um, our youngest son um, broke his arm, and the bone was sticking out of the arm and all kinds yeah, of craziness. Yeah, he's jumping his bike, and he comes in, and his arm is like, at a 90 degree angle and, and I'm, the, I'm the one who passed out a line before she gave blood because I don't <laughs> I don't do blood I don't I don't do bones sticking out of arms anyway he goes to the hospital has to have surgery and I'll never forget he was on this gurney he never cried until he was on this gurney and they are taking him off and his mama and his dad are standing there watching him leave and I'm just in a pile on the floor I'm thinking I can't even do this. And it was one of those moments. It's like, Lord, oh my gosh, take care of my child. Take care of my baby. I can't, I can't handle this. But God, God does that for us because he loves us and he knows what we need even more than we know what we need. Yeah. So it's good news to you today that you can be an absolute wreck where you don't even, you got emotions going every which direction, anger, fear, anxiety, stress, whatever's going on confusion, all this, you can sit down in the presence of the Lord and go, Lord, I don't know what to do. I'm so upset right now. I don't even know what to pray. And will you please hear the attitude of my heart? And the Holy Spirit translates that for you into a meaningful prayer. If that's good news to you today, would you say amen? Amen. I mean, this is what happens. I mean, it could be a broken arm. I mean, there were some times you were praying pretty stressed out about girls they were dating, too. Uh, all of the girls. Okay. Uh. <laughs> that's another whole topic. Wow. Okay, anyway. But there, were, <laughs> but there are just times when you're sitting there going, God, I don't know how I feel about this. I don't know. And Hannah was right there, and she's crying out to God, and she's so bitter. I mean, Peninnah has just taken the knife in her back and twisted it one more time, and she can't take it. And so she runs to the Lord. And listen to this life application. If you and I will surrender our worries and stress to the Lord, he'll give us peace. She did that. At a time when everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes, Hannah got up from the table and ran to the Lord. Peninnah was doing what was right in her eyes. Elkanah had done what was right in his eyes. Hannah ran to the Lord. And tell you what a dark time it was. The priest sitting there thought she was drunk. So apparently people would come and pray half smashed a lot of times. Who knows? And so that's why when you read about the godly man Samuel you look back behind him, well, he had a godly mom who'd surrendered him from day one to be completely devoted to the Lord. And that's when she found peace. And you, Debbie, when you and I were talking, this was the point that stood out to you the most. This was, this is amazing because if you notice in the scripture, it said um, she prayed and then she went away and, and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. She had no idea what her future was. Her circumstances at that point had not even changed. But her face was no longer downcast because she put her hope um, in the Lord. I mean, that those verses, pour out all your worries and stress upon him and leave him there for he always tenderly cares for you. That's First Peter. I mean, that's what she experienced was peace. Oh, yeah. I mean, listen to a couple of scriptures. I'm just going to read four of them back to back. These are things that Hannah would have agreed with in her heart. Psalm 55, 22, give your burdens to the Lord and he will take care of you. Hannah actually believed that. That's why when she prayed, she was okay. I mean, she had peace. Pour out your worries and stress upon him and leave them there for he always tenderly cares for you. First Peter 5, 7. I mean, she actually did that. She had to go back to the party. Remember, She's there one night. She had to go back to the feasting. Peninnah and the kids would still be there mocking her. Elkanah's going, hey, baby, welcome back. Am I not better than 10 kids, huh? She had, to, she had to go through that. He was still there. The party was still going on. Everything was just like it was. But Hannah was different because she actually believed the Lord was going to take care of her. Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, not your circumstances, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Hannah fixed her thoughts on the Lord, gave the problem to him, and then she was no longer sad, and she could go back and eat. I'm leaving you with a gift. 
Peace of mind and heart, Jesus said, and the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give, so don't be troubled or afraid. I mean, if you're going to live in this world and be a mom with peace according to our worldly standards, you got to have all the kids got to be healthy, everybody's getting good grades, money's coming in, the car's running great, the dog's behaving, you got a great relationship with the neighbors, you got a great relationship with your in-laws, you're even having a great hair day, then you have peace. Now I got peace, everything's going my way. Well, how many days are I like wait, that? I'm waiting on that day to happen. Okay, I know. <laughs> I, will, I wanted to point out one thing. You know, this had been happening for years. And I don't want you to get the impression that this just happened, and boom, Hannah goes, and she prays, and she leaves it with the Lord, and then she's, she's got all this peace. I think she had to work and struggle through this for a long time. Mm. And that's the way it is with a lot of our problems and our heartache, is that we have to get to a place of surrender. And that's where Hannah was. That's yeah. where she was. She, she got to that place where she could just leave it with the Lord and surrender it. Yeah, and so one more leg in the story is this, is that the prayers were answered. By the way, we never told everybody uh, our son Graham's arm was fine. They got it all put back together. So, yeah. sorry. I just want to let you know. Here's the rest of this story. The entire family got up early the next morning and went to worship the Lord once more. And then they returned home to Ramah. And when Elkanah slept with Hannah, the Lord remembered her plea. And in due time, she gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel. For she said, I asked the Lord for him. And when the child was weaned, Hannah took him to the tabernacle in Shiloh. And they brought along a three-year-old bull for the sacrifice and a basket of flour and some wine. And after sacrificing the bull, they brought the boy to Eli. Sir, do you remember me? Hannah asked. I'm the very woman who stood here several years ago praying to the Lord. I asked the Lord to give me this boy, and he has granted my request. And now I am giving him to the Lord, and he will belong to the Lord his whole life. And they worshiped the Lord there. And the Lord blessed Hannah, and she conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. And meanwhile, Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Yeah, and what's important to realize here, there wasn't just a child dedication ceremony. When they say she dedicated him to the Lord there, she presented him to the Lord, I mean, she left him with the old priest. And she'd said, Lord, I promised you I would dedicate this child for his whole life. Here he is. And there's even a little more in the next chapter we didn't have room for where she'd prepare a special tunic for him every year that looked just like the priestly garbs the older men wore. And then he would dress the same. And he grew up there in the presence of the Lord. And she'd come see him at least once a year on those feast days. But she trusted the Lord so much that she actually gave him back. I think that would be hard to do. Oh, my gosh. I can't even imagine doing that. Here she makes a vow that if the Lord will give her a child, she will dedicate him and give him back um, so that he can serve the Lord all of his days, which he did. But I got to tell you, as a mom, I cannot even imagine giving up a, I don't know how long it took to wean somebody in those days, three, three years, three years yeah. or, or so, mm -hmm. but I can't imagine doing that. I would have come up with 101 reasons why the Lord really didn't want me to take him back. I was just going to raise him to be a godly little boy. I mean, I can't imagine the pain, but she did it with joy, and she remained faithful to the Lord, and it's just an incredible testimony um, of her faith, and she passed that along to Samuel. He was an amazing, godly man. And I, I think it's so important to hit this on Mother's Day because in the book of Samuel, Samuel stands up against corruption. He stands up against the enemies of God. He's a man of courage. He is a man who is, has undivided loyalty to the Lord. And they included this story. Man, where did he get that undivided loyalty? His mom exhibited it first. Moms, never underestimate the impact you're having on your children. Never underestimate that. Man, I mean, the butane torch and the keys, and all, that's great. But I'm telling you, the, the impact you have on your kids. I mean, Samuel exhibited the same sort of total commitment to the Lord that his mom did. And I want to give us a couple of other applications real quickly here. First of all, children are a gift from the Lord. From the, uh, they're a reward from him. That's Psalm 127.3. The reason I put that in there is sometimes, Debbie, in the middle of teenage years, it's kind of hard to remember that. Yeah, it's, they don't always feel like a gift, but they are a gift, especially when you read a woman like Hannah that had trouble conceiving. 
I mean, what a, a, a miracle that God allows us to be a part of giving life. Yeah, and so sometimes when we're going through difficulty, it's always important to remember, Lord, you gave me this child. I'm raising this child. Lord, help me understand this child. Lord, help me raise this child as I should. Give me advice. Give me courage. Give me strength. Give me wisdom. All those things are legitimate to pray because this is a gift from the Lord. If anybody understood this, Hannah did. She understood it so much, she gave it back. And like Debbie said before, she wasn't guaranteed of having any more kids. We know that after we read this, the Lord blessed her with more children. There was no guarantee of that. And you got the idea that she was at peace no matter what happened next. Secondly, it's important to remember that the most important thing as parents we can do is train our children to love the Lord because we must all let go of our kids eventually. Now, not at age three. I mean, this is not a message to say that when your kids are three, you should bring them all to the church office at center point and let us raise them. I don't know. No, no, no. That's not the point of the story. There is a point in the story, though, that every single child, every single parent, we got to let them go eventually. And that's why uh, the wisdom that Solomon gives in Proverbs 22 is so important. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he's old, he won't depart from it. And again, that's a proverb. It's not a promise. Kids make their choices. I mean, my parents raised me with things, and then I went off to college and did a bunch of things they, I knew that they wouldn't have agreed with. And you don't have to raise your hand and say you did that too, okay? But I did know what they had taught me. I did. And so did you. And your kids will know what you teach them. And it's awfully important that we prepare them so that they can leave. And ultimately, the Lord is their father. He is the one that does a better job of teaching them than we do. But as a mom, I poured into my boys um, spiritually, and you pray and pray and pray and pray. And then one day, I mean, you raise them to be independent. And I didn't have to give them up when they were three, but I did give them up when they went off to school, and it still ripped my heart out. And I remember mm. our oldest went off to Furman in Greenville, South Carolina, and I remember John and I drove over there, and I mean, I, like yesterday, I can remember every detail of leaving him there, walking across that we had left him, walked across that campus. I could barely even get to the cars crying so hard, and then we both got there. We cried all the way from Greenville to Atlanta, I think. Both of us did. But yeah, I don't want to talk about it. Anyway. <laughs> you don't remember that part, do you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was harder than we thought. But we did. I do remember this. We did pull over, and we prayed about this. We go, we this is ridiculous. Yep. We prayed this child will get in this school. He's in this great school. We've raised him. God's going to take care of him. We can't. We got to chin up. And um, <laughs> anyway. Uh, one last life application, God rewards faithfulness and honors those who trust in him. And oh, he rewarded Hannah's faithfulness. Yes. He rewarded Samuel for his faithfulness. He'll reward us for our faithfulness. If we are faithful in a time when people are faithless, God notices. And we live in a culture where people are pretty much doing whatever they want to do. It's right in their own eyes. Well, it's important that they... I mean, it's important that we trust in the Lord. Others will notice this too if we actually go to the Lord with our problems. Remember what we've talked about here today, that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He understands. He'll give us grace and mercy when we need it most. But who's coming? When we have to surrender our kids, he'll watch out for them. But who's surrendering? Who's keeping their promises even when it hurts? Well, Hannah did. And that's why you know a lot of people named Hannah. I doubt you know one Peninna in the whole world. I've never even heard of one. I mean, John, all she knew was sarcasm. But you got a little bit from I, Hannah. This system. is like the end of a story. It's first, second, first Samuel, the second chapter. Hannah has a prayer of praise. And it just, oh, it just makes me smile to hear it. She said, my heart rejoices in the Lord. Oh, how the Lord has blessed me. Now I have an answer for my enemies as I delight in your deliverance. No one is holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. And it goes on, but how she praised him because she knew he was the one that answered her prayers. Oh, yeah, and that's who we want to be. Just remind you, Paul said, All glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Debbie and I have prayed with people over the fertility issue. And we've seen God answer those prayers and give them beautiful children. Other times we've seen them adopt whole families, and they would even tell you or through foster care or adoption, God has blessed them in ways they never even imagined. 
But what if we come to God with our problems? He'll hear us, that's what. And what if we trust him and leave the problems there? Then he'll give us peace. And what if we're faithful to trust him and be obedient to him even when it hurts and to let our children go and trust him with them? Well, then we will live lives of blessing like Hannah and Samuel. And that's where God wants us to be. Why don't you pray for the moms? I'm going to pray for the rest of us. Okay. Let's pray together. Holy Father, we just come before you and we just praise you and thank you because you are so good. Oh, Lord, you are the only one worthy of our praise. God, I just praise you that um, you allow us as um, your children to be a part of life, of giving life to others. What an incredible privilege. Thank you, Father. And Lord, I just want to pray for any of the women in here who are hurting um, for various reasons. Maybe their children have turned their back on them. Maybe um, they've been making bad choices. Maybe they're struggling with infertility and they, all they want is to be a mom. God, I pray that you would give us compassion for them. But Lord, I pray for healing for them. Physically, emotionally, spiritual healing, Lord. Oh, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just fall on us in new powerful ways. And Holy Spirit, I just praise you and thank you that you pray on our behalf when we don't even know how to speak the words. God, thank you for our mothers. We all have mothers. Thank you, Father. Father, I thank you for raising up a godly man like Samuel. And I thank you that his undying, undivided commitment to you started with his mom before he was even born. Oh, I pray that every woman here will hear that, that the, they can make an enormous difference, a life-changing amazingly significant difference just by being faithful themselves. And God, I pray that every man in the room, Lord, that you remind us to be thankful for our moms, to encourage them, to help when they can. And Lord, I pray that you remind us to turn our problems over to you too. This isn't just Hannah's example works for all of us, not just moms. Oh, Lord, hear our prayer. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you give us grace and mercy when we need it most. Oh, Lord. We love you. We surrender our problems to you now. Hear our prayers even when we can't articulate them. In the name of Jesus, amen.